do I have the ability to do what I want to, you know, to go and actually file an eviction or enforce my lease? And I say, if you have the ability to enforce your lease, you should, because if you lay down and just give up right now and get steamrolled, that's what people are hoping for. They'll, they're hoping you'll give up. Um, and that just emboldens your tenants, whether you're a mom and pop or an institutional player is irrelevant. Unless you're enforcing your lease, your tenants become emboldened. Hi, this is Chris German. Welcome back to The Apartment Dealer Show. Do we have a treat for you today? Today, I'll be interviewing both Steven Spear of Spear, Woodward, Corbelis, Goldberg, and Mike Brennan of the Brennan Law Firm. Between the two individuals, they've spent decades within the real estate uh, law space. Steve Spear practices more on the business of real estate law, and Mike Brennan focuses on tenant landlord law. Uh, more uh, easily understood as uh, essentially evictions and and um, judgments and so forth. Today, we're going to address the recent changes that have taken place with respect to tenant landlord law. We're going to be flying at a 20,000 uh, foot elevation. So we're not going to dig into the weeds of the recent uh, changes here in California per se. We're going to be do leave that for our educational event that's coming up in a few weeks. But we are going to deal with the idea of, well, how do you continue to thrive as a landlord when many things are working against you from rising interest rates to inflation to politicians who look out more for tenants than they do landlords? How do you thrive? That's the question that we're going to address on today's show. If you have not already, be sure to subscribe to our channel as we release these videos. Again, as if you've been an avid viewer of viewing our videos of any time, you know it's just meat and potatoes. We're not selling anything here. It's purely informational and the information you need as a landlord, as an investor, to thrive within multifamily properties. You and I are building a financial legacy when it comes to our real estate portfolio. And in the building of that real estate and in the building of that legacy, I should say, we need to have the right resources, information, and network of professionals that can assist us. That's what we do here. Be sure to subscribe, give the video a like, share a comment. And with that, help me welcome Steven Spear and Mike Brennan. So gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having us. Now, of course, for those investors who are avid watchers of our YouTube channel or they've been to any of our educational events, they are uh, more than familiar with the two of you. But for that one investor who has yet to hear the name Steven Spear and Mike Brennan, um, if you could share with us, obviously you have extensive track records in your individual fields within real estate law. Can you share with the viewers what your individual specialties are? Maybe Steve, we'll start with you. So our law firm uh, with offices in Redondo Beach, California and Denver, Colorado, uh, focuses exclusively on real estate, business and estate planning. So everything that has to do with money, money creation, money magnification and money preservation focused specifically in real estate and various businesses. Separate from that, and for the same 44 years that I've been practicing law, we've created investments in real estate for ourselves, friends, family, and our, our, and our own money. We are always the either the largest or one of the largest investors uh, in cash in these properties. And so today, we have industrial buildings, commercial buildings, retail space, office space, and about 2,600 apartment units in California, Colorado, Arizona, and Washington, and a full-time staff uh, of W-2 employees, uh, about 100 and, I think 105 people full-time doing the maintenance, management, bookkeeping, and accounting. And I'm proud to say we have a lot of people who are retiring on the money that we send them every month. What this does is it helps us as lawyers to be able to advise clients who are in the apartment business and in the real estate business, not just from a legal perspective, but from our own business perspective. And, Mike. and my name is Mike Brennan. Uh, we are a landlord tenant firm in Arcadia, California, 
We represent landlords exclusively in landlord-tenant litigation and negotiations. Uh, we do primarily evictions and judgment enforcement, what we do to negotiations. Uh, we represent landlords in front of agency actions, any sort of litigation, really. Um, and I've been doing this exclusively for 15 years now. I've That's the only type of law I've ever practiced. Uh, we, My family, my, my wife's family, we are landlords as well. Um, so we, and prior to that, I had a background in commercial brokerage. So we, we come at this from a, a lot of different angles. It's, I think it's a unique perspective that allows us to do what we do. Currently, I sit on the board of directors for a local trade association. I've sat on several throughout the 15 years, and I am also a member of the legislative committees. So what that means is really I see the laws before they're passed. I see them when they're up in Sacramento working their way through uh, the legislative process. I see which laws affect landlords and how they'll be implemented afterwards. And Mike, you serve landlords in what geographic areas? Uh, we go all the way from current. I mean, I've gone up to San Francisco for specific cases, but we go generally from Kern County, uh, Santa Barbara County, down to San Diego County and everywhere in between. Excellent. Excellent. Well, the last two years has seen a lot of new tenant uh, landlord law, obviously, with the beginning of uh, COVID and not only new law, but then that those laws continue to change. From a landlord's perspective, it's not like they're receiving notices in the mail, right? That that here there's this new law, or here are the new changes. Essentially, you have to have a resource you can turn to. Can a landlord claim ignorance? Can a landlord be to blame if if truthfully they just didn't know that, hey, there's this new moratorium that passed or their local city implemented something? And again, they haven't received any type of official notice. I, I'll tell you that the old expression, uh, ignorance of the law is no excuse, applies here. Uh, a person can be uh, uh, in violate is in violation of a law, whether they know the law exists or not. Everyone is presumed to know all laws. Now, of course, no one knows all laws. Not the most experienced lawyer knows all laws but we're all assumed to be up to date on laws. So saying I didn't know doesn't help. I agree with everything he said. I'll add two points to that. First of all, there's the black letter law, but there's also a case law that interprets that law. So, you know, whether a landlord's guilty of that law or, or violating that law or not, take, for example, the, the recent moratoriums. There's a lot of open interpretation in there. So we wouldn't know if a landlord necessarily violated a law until it works its way through and a court makes that determination. The second thing I would add to that is there are when a law goes into effect, some laws like the law that I anticipate going into effect tomorrow is done as emergency legislation and it goes into effect right away. Some laws are passed and it takes a while before they're implemented. And there is I won't call it a grace period. Obviously, until it's implemented, you're not held to it. But once you are, I've seen judges even be very flexible about the, the application of that law when it just went into effect and a landlord has been in that gray zone as to whether or not they're violating it. So Stephen's absolutely right. Everybody's expected to know the law. And there's thousands and thousands and thousands of laws that affect landlords. Um, but it's I just don't want to create a fear that, oh, my gosh, I can't make a move because I'm going to violate some law somewhere. There's there's. There's some flexibility in it. And when it comes to these uh, recent changes in law, what would the two of you say is the, and, and again, here in California, is the general direction, the severity of these changes? I mean, is this, as a lot of it's portrayed, well, it's temporary, it's just to assist tenants, given the circumstances we've dealt with the last two years, or is this more of a overarching theme that we should plan to see as investors and landlords. Now, Mike, since you're involved, obviously, on the legislative side, what, what's your take on this? I think that uh, while it is often stated that this is just a temporary law, this is a temporary protection, I think it would be very naive for landlords to believe that. I'll give you a perfect example is statewide rent control, right? It was implemented, it was voted on in, uh, or signed into law in 2019. It was stated as just a... a kind of a, a white bread version of the local ordinances, which in fact it is, as soon as it's passed, COVID hits and they 
over the last two years, they've been implementing uh, more stringent changes to that. So in law, you, you learn the, uh, in law school, you learn the saying, the slippery slope, right? These laws, I think, especially in the last couple of years, are just, just the tip of the iceberg. I think what's coming, and, and as I said, I see this stuff, what is coming is going to get worse for landlords. I'll give you another great example. May, both of you may know this already. The city actually has a motion that they're considering right now, the city of Los Angeles, that will prohibit landlords from using credit reports to screen tenants. So there's no backing off these laws. There's a, there's a reason for it. We're facing, the country is facing some economic challenges uh, in state of Cal housing is through the roof. Affordability is low. Uh, state of California recognizes that there are more renters than there are owners and they are pandering and developing these laws designed specifically to protect the tenants. I could go even deeper into this, but I think that answers your question. Uh, income tax was supposed to be uh, temporary when it was put in a little over 100 years ago. And so depending on how you define temporary, I guess it might be temporary. Right. Uh, no, I don't think any, I think any time any uh, governmental entity uh, uh, assumes a power, it's very, very rare that it's voluntarily given up. But, you know, in terms of uh, ownership, I've heard that, hey, the small mom and pops are the ones that are going to get really hammered. In other words, if they only own one five unit building, they'll be much more impacted than, say, someone who owns 10 buildings in various cities and counties and locations and what have you. You know, in other words, diversification, diversification matters here. What would be your guys' thoughts on that? Obviously, you're also investors. So um, does it help to be a more sizable owner with all the new changes and, and things that we've seen and, and we'll see? Sure. You start with the fact that a, a, a larger owner is simply more is paying more attention because they have to. You got you got more units. You've got to think about it more. You've got to pay attention to it more. You're more likely to have the economies of scale. And if you're diversified in area, something that hits you in one county might not hit you in another. <clears throat> but overall, it, it is someone who dabbles in anything is not going to do well as is not going to do as well as someone who's really paying attention to it. So yes, uh, uh, in this case, bigger is better. I agree with Stephen 100%. Uh, it, it's, it's just difficult to navigate everything. This goes back to knowing the laws. It's difficult to navigate everything as what I'll call a mom and pop investor. Um, and as Stephen pointed out, geography makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So one county has different rules. One city has different rules. Some are more onerous than others. But from a statewide perspective, I think if you're looking at the state laws, the state law laws are fairly easy to navigate and they're fairly easy for, for mom and pops to comply with. It's when you get down to these local levels that they just become so burdensome that I see the mom and pops, especially in Southern California, uh, just getting squeezed out. And my larger clients are, are happy. I mean, they can navigate it. They can pick up these properties. I won't say they pick them up cheap, but they pick them up with the knowledge that they can absorb the costs and it, the, the impact on their bottom line is relatively minimal. You're right about that, Mike, all of it. And you mentioned, you know, the state laws are easier to navigate than say the more the, the, the more local laws. And so the most um, or the most aggressive uh, overreach of government was rent control. And this passed, of course, that it affects all multifamily properties uh, in California unless they were built within the last 15 years. But in your opinions, um, how does rent control not only affect the landlords, but affect housing in general and then a second to that is in light of rent control how do you still thrive as an investor you know I, when i when i hear people say no rent control doesn't really stop real estate development because they exempt new buildings the clients i talk to who are real estate developers who are people who invest with real estate developers to the people who are are in any aspect of that business their answer is, no, I don't believe that. I don't trust it. I'll just invest in something else. I don't have to take these sorts of governmental regulation risks in. This is why we have a housing shortage. If developers could look and say, gee, I can get rich 
building apartment buildings, we wouldn't have a housing shortage. It's the fact that nobody wants to build them or very few people want to build them. And the ones who do frequently aren't capable of building them. That's why we have a housing shortage. Nationwide, I understand it's 4 million units short in a housing shortage. And it's because of the uh, the handcuffs that are put on uh, developers where uh, going through the city and getting approvals is hard and the permits are expensive and all of the rules that allow all of the neighbors to object to things are expensive. And it ends up the, the wealthy turn out just fine as usual, but it's the middle class and the poor that then have to pay much more money for housing. And so, and so it's a, it's a dynamic situation. Supply and demand is like the law of gravity. You cannot defy it. Uh, and, and when you have that much burden on people who would buy or own or operate uh, apartment units, you're going to have a housing shortage. That's why we have a housing shortage. That is, that is a large portion of the whole reason why we have a, a housing shortage. Um, and like Stephen, I agree. Everybody I know that is in the position to develop certainly looks at you know whether that property is going to be a rent controlled property or not before they're willing to develop. There are incentives out there for certain developers, um, but more often than not recently, those incentives to develop include building a regular apartment building with a, a low and ultra low income uh, component to it. So you know, the, the topic of rent control, Chris, is extremely complicated. There have been think tanks across the country that have written theses on these. And it's been proven time and time again that rent control actually exacerbates the problem, creates more problems for the tenants, creates limited opportunities for the tenants because they become generationally locked into a single place and they don't want to move because they're fearful of paying the rent. You asked a very important question, which I almost think might be more important than, you know, how does rent control impact things? The question is, how do you survive in rent control? When your, your rents are artificially capped and inflation is outpacing what you're permitted to increase, you're naturally going to put less money into the rehabilitation of the building and the maintenance because you can't. You don't have the resources to do it. Um, the impact of that is significant on everybody. And the only way, and I think this is where it becomes more important than the question of rent control, because I think rent control is here and it's here to stay. And it may just sweep across the country in one form or another. But how do you survive in rent control is a big issue. The way investors traditionally survive in rent control is turning over units, because at that point, when somebody vacates, the unit becomes decontrolled and the investor can reset the rent at any amount they want. If you look at there's there's a growing trend. This was attempted once before in the city of Santa Monica. Uh, Santa Monica tried to control even vacant units so that you couldn't raise it beyond what the last tenant was was paying. And that was shot down in court. Now you're starting to see these growing movements again about vacancy control. So that concerns me more than the rent control, because what is going to happen if you can't raise those rents, then then the owners are not going to be able to survive. And it's going to be, as Stephen alluded to, a greater gap between those who can actually afford to have those buildings and those who can't afford them anymore and have to sell them on the market. So I, I think all in all, it, it hurts landlords, it hurts tenants, it hurts society. Um, the, the, like I said, there, this is a very complex topic and there's a lot to it and we can't go into it all here, but anybody who thinks uh, rent control is, a, is just a tenant protection and it works out great is, is being misled. When I, you know, my secret sauce as an investor has been for as long as it lasts to use the substantial improve, improvement rule under the statewide rent control to purchase units, vacate them, uh, do the substantial improvements, and then get essentially above market rent. So one of two things now, we have a much better rent than even say what would be average for the market, number one. And number two, as we're controlled by rent control, at least that baseline of which the percentages are going to be based on starts that much higher. So it'll take that much longer for me really to fall behind market because we're starting at such a high level. And again, um, hopefully, you know, this will stick around. I imagine they'll get wise to it at some point, realizing I'm not the only investor that's doing this right, buying buildings and turning them over where you can. And uh, but I think, in, in my opinion, it's the best way to get 
your unit, your building to market level, assuming the financials work and it makes sense to to put this type of money into the properties. One of the arguments you'll hear for uh, rent control is, well, you're exempt from rent control for 15 years. Well, what a developer hears is not, gee, that's good, you got 15 years. What the developer hears is, what I'm about to develop, if I go to sell it, will sell for less because the buyer knows that in 15, 14, 13 years from now, that the rent control will zoom in and who knows what it'll be. And so any way you slice it, it's a drag on business and it's a drag on the market. And if the priority is to keep rich people from getting richer at the expense of making middle class and poor people poorer, well, then I guess it's a good goal. But that doesn't seem like anything anybody wants. Chris, I want to go back to something that you just said, because it actually uh, buttresses the point we were making before. Statewide rent control. Right now, what you're doing, yeah, you're not the only guy out there doing it. Most people are. You, you turning those units over under the substantial remodel. As we all know, during COVID, that was knocked out in most cases. Um, but that law is only two years old. And last year, they started beefing it up. As I was saying before, it's a slippery slope. And they are attempting to take that substantial remodel out of the statewide rent control law or just cause law. And what they're doing right now is they're changing, for example, the amount of time um, and whether you have to pull permits first or not. Right now, you don't have to pull permits. You just serve the notice, et cetera. They are trying to get through Sacramento that you will have to pull your permits first and it will require a, the tenant to vacate for a period of time of 120 days or more. And then you might have to just also fill out some forms on why vacating is justified under the substantial remodel. So this is an example of what I mean, where these laws just, once they get implemented, it's just a question of tightening down on the landlords. They, they pass a kind of watered down version intentionally to get broader support. And then once it's in place, they can crank it down as much as they want. Right now, say 5% plus inflation, They'll change it to say 4%, 3%, 2% plus inflation. And then they'll change it to say 2% plus 60% of inflation, 50% inflation. So this is all, this is salami slicing tactics. uh, And, and anyone who looks at this should, should be aware that there is a substantial risk and you've got to be, you've got to be prepared for it. You've got to buy the property accordingly. And, have financing on the property that isn't explosive so that you can hold on during the tough times because the people who make the largest fortunes in real estate are the ones who can hold on when it, when the when there's blood flowing in the streets now for the past several years you know landlords uh, have had issues with either non-paying tenants problem tenants and and as we've discussed the state has made it very difficult to Uh, evict these tenants make your way through the court system and although it can be done many landlords have taken the position of well it's just not worth the headache as of now it's just not worth tangling with tenants trying to work through the system because they feel like it's a losing a battle um what what's your take on that i mean if, if there's a problem tenant and they've moved in people that shouldn't be there or they're not following some uh, letter of the law that's within the rental agreement or they haven't paid and so forth and where you can and, you know, depending on the moratoriums. Um, the question more so is not, can we do it right now? I realize there's, you know, there's new law, there's a new law that just passed, but more so, should they make the effort? Should they take the time? Should they see it as a losing battle or should they essentially fight for their property rights? What's uh, anyone, anyone who gives up uh, uh, is, is making a mistake. Where are you going to invest your money? You want to put it in the stock market? Uh, you want to invest it in gold? All of these things have serious drawbacks and an absence of the powers and advantages that real estate has. You have appreciation, depreciation, appropriate leverage. You have the fact that supply and demand is 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 going to uh, is going to hold up the value of real estate because the employment bone is connected to the apartment bone. And as long as there are jobs, people need to put their heads on the pillow somewhere. And while other forms of real estate like industrial or office or retail or uh, could could end up faltering depending on a recession, 
apartments, you still have to have somebody's got to sleep somewhere. And there are plenty of jobs that can't be outsourced to China or somewhere else, and they can't be lost to the internet. If you have someone who is a cafeteria worker, a custodian, a car mechanic, that person's job doesn't go up onto the internet, and that person can't commute from some other country. They've got to sleep in a bed, in an apartment, near a place where they work. And so giving up is not the answer. The answer is learning the rules, learning how to navigate, taking it seriously, getting the right advisors, the the, the right uh, CPAs, the right attorneys, the right apartment dealer, Chris German would be mm-hmm. my choice, and, and learn what to do to cope with it. Giving up is no solution to anything. Now, Mike, uh, Steve addressed, uh, you know, giving up in total, right? You know, being, being an investor. So I'll let you answer the second part of the question of in terms of fighting in the, in the courts now to, to um, hold on to what the rules are of your rental agreements and to ensure that the tenants are behaving and paying. Uh, what's your take? Because I hear many landlords that say, well, I'm just not going to deal with it now because it's just uh, either going to be too costly. The lawyers are just going to draw out the process to make a buck and yada, yada. I mean, what's your, what's your take, Mike, since you're most heavily involved in the eviction side of it? Building on what Steven said, we've all heard the saying, the only thing it takes for evil to succeed is good people to do nothing. And so the first question that the landlord has to ask is, is the law on my side? Do I have the ability, if I wanted to, do I have the ability to do what I want to, you know, to go and actually file an eviction or enforce my lease? And I say, if you have the ability to enforce your lease, you should, because if you lay down and just give up right now and get steamrolled, that's what people are hoping for. They'll, they're hoping you'll give up. Um, and that just emboldens your tenants, whether you're a mom and pop or an institutional player is irrelevant. Unless you're enforcing your lease, your tenants become emboldened. And when your tenants become emboldened, they start pushing. And if you've already given up, they're going to push beyond what you normally would have had pushback on and start taking more and more and more. Unless you do something to stop it. And and I encourage landlords to do this building wide. I, I just had a consultation with another client that I was talking to and we were talking about he just remodeled most of the units in his building and he's got a bunch of new tenants coming in. And we were talking about the need for him to explain these leases to the tenants and let the tenants know that he's serious about them. Breaches of the lease will be dealt with accordingly. Um, I don't believe in laying down. Now, having said that, I also believe that there is a reasonable factor to this and a middle ground. You don't want to go out there and be overly aggressive either. Um, And the problem with that is we've got a lot of anti-tenant harassment laws that are popping up now. So you have to, like I said, you have to know what you can do. You have to be reasonable about how you go about it. And the key is really just disassociate yourself from recognize it as an asset and look at it unemotionally. When I hear people say, I just don't want to go through it. What I hear is I'm really tired of all this nonsense and I just don't want to deal with it anymore. And that's, that's almost more of an emotional response. You've got a lease, you've got a court system. If you've got the ability to enforce it, enforce it, keep a distance from your tenants. It's an asset, you know, but, but respect their rights and, and, you know, their, their privacy as well but certainly enforce the lease. And, and I, I'll add to that one more thing. You would be shocked. A lot of landlords are always talking about, oh, the laws are written against us. The laws are written against us. And I'm not going to say that some of them not the more recent laws they are. But if you really do this day in and day out, like I do, you'll see that the laws are not necessarily against them. The problem is they don't know all the laws and they don't know how to really enforce their rights. And the tenants all have these free tenant attorneys that know the laws and know how to enforce their rights. So the tenants have this great force on their side and the landlords are just like, oh my gosh, I just bought this to retire. I didn't wanna become an attorney and have to learn all this stuff. And they don't know how they can push forward. So it's it's a balancing act, but I certainly think you should always enforce your leases. Now the, the theme of our upcoming uh, educational luncheon that uh, the two of you will be speaking at is, is the door of opportunity closing for multifamily investments? And the reason why we pose that question is because you have a side of uh, the laws and rent control that landlords are having to um, 
cope with and work through. Uh, you have interest rates that now have begun to climb, right? So for the past three decades, essentially interest rates have been on a downward trend. This point going forward, most would say, well, we're going to be on an upward trend. Why? Because the second thing we're tackling with is inflation. And the reason why landlords are, when I say landlords are having to tackle with that, it's mainly because of their tenants. Um, I just interviewed Stephen Hall, who you guys are familiar with from our event. And we were going through inflation. Food alone has gone up 30%. And so the reason why that's a big deal is because as interest rates rise and debt gets more expensive, there's going to be a compression on cap rates, right? The difference between an interest rate and the rate of return on the building, essentially. And if we cannot push rents because more of a tenant's discretionary income is being eaten up by their living expenses, will that become problematic for landlords as we uh, are going forward? So I'm curious as to your guys' take. Again, we have inflation, rising interest rates. We have the idea that of all that we see within the economy and throughout the world, this idea of the Great Reset, where, again, there's going to be a financial push and pull here. Um, what what are your thoughts on the state of things, Steve, that um, definitely are in the days ahead as we look at the economy and being uh, landlords? The one thing that's not going to change is the fact that we live in a country where total strangers will buy real estate for you. And those strangers are called tenants. And if that sounds unfair to any tenant who's listening, become a landlord. It's not that hard. It's it's doable. It's doable. Sometimes you might need, depending on your position in life, you might need five or 10 years to really get the ball rolling. But it's worth it because five or 10 years from now, you'll be five or 10 years older anyway. Might as well own some real estate. So that would be the first thing. I wouldn't worry if you own real estate. I think you need to handle problems. I think you need to respond to problems. But I wouldn't worry about it. Inflation is something which, if you own real estate, is not going to be the enemy. Even things like rent control, which are horrible, uh, are manageable and navigable and problems are solvable. And so I'm not seeing on the horizon things which are catastrophic. Higher interest rates will be a challenge when you're trying to buy property or refinance property. But with, with, with a proper loan, with a stabilized interest rate and payment, with a long enough term, you can go through the various cycles. And if you have enough cash in the property, then you're okay. The people who get in trouble in real estate most for most most prominently in all our memories was the 2008 crash, were the people who had exploding loans, loans where the interest rates all of a sudden changed unpredictably, and the payments changed, and they didn't have down payments, and they hadn't really been qualified. If you get the right advice up front, and you're cautious and careful about how you do it, there's no right or wrong time to buy real estate. There are right and wrong ways to buy real estate. Well, I think everything Stephen said is is accurate. It's in cycles. Everything is in cycles. The pendulum swings. And as Stephen knows, even the Supreme Court swings. So you can have case law right now that is making certain things illegal and a, and a new Supreme Court will, which, which, it, which it has changed over the past several years, a new Supreme Court will start overruling certain decisions and start moving things back. And economic cycles change as well. We may have a, a few years of ugly ugliness. I'll just put it that way. Um, the, the one thing I would say is, you know, Stephen alluded to it when he was talking about the problems. The key really is anticipating what the problems are. You know, not everybody's got the capacity of you, Chris, or Stephen, or the other people that are generally on the panel to look at the bigger picture and all the dynamics that are involved in this long haul. So they have to hire advisors like Stephen who can look at a bigger picture and say, okay, this is where we're, I see us in 10 years. This is where I see us in 15 years. You, you Chris, you, you, you seem to do a phenomenal job of making money out of real estate and helping people do that. What I will say is, and, and I've said this before, and Chris, if you want to edit this out, I, I, I totally understand, but I'm not as optimistic as Stephen, and I'm looking at bigger pictures. And I think that, I think we've had a really good run in, in multifamily. I think multifamily is going to take some pretty big hits. Um, to, just to use the example of the 30% increase in food. 
when you see the legislation that comes out and the mindset behind the legislation, it's constantly talking about why we need all these laws. And we need them because people are rent burdened and they're paying 50% of their income on rent. And now their food's going up 30%. There's nothing we can do about the 30% on food because we're in a war with Ukraine who produces 25% of the world's grain. And so there's food shortages. All that gets mind numbing after a while. But if you're looking at the, the thought process behind it is these people are trying to protect these tenants. And I think that the pendulum has been swinging for the last decade and it's going to continue to swing um, against multifamily landlords through increased bureaucracy, increased laws, more difficult challenges. At least I'm talking more in California than other places. California is the tip of the spear on this stuff. And the other aspect of this that, that I'll say to both of you, Chris and Stephen, I keep bringing this up to people and it, it, I'm not sure people understand it the way I think I do. Chris, you mentioned The Great Reset. If you want to read a great book, it, also written by Klaus, is The Fourth Industrial Revolution. Um, another book that kind of gives us insight on where we're going. Elon Musk came out several years ago to Congress and said, look, AI is taking over. And in 40, what most people believe is in 40 years, 50% of the jobs will be gone. And Musk said, that's absolutely wrong. In 25 years, 75% of the jobs will be gone. So if you believe that analysis, and I know he knows more about it than I do, but if you believe that, and, and we're starting to see the rise of a living wage, Los Angeles, just today, it was announced Los Angeles is kicking in that $1,000 a month living wage. What's on the mind of the politicians who are crafting these laws? Lock, lack of jobs, lack of people to uh, ability to pay their, their way through life. How are they going to afford housing? Oh, we better protect them. And who's, how are we going to do that? We're going to regulate the landlords and find ways to, to, I hate to say it, but to legislate these guys out of these buildings one way or another, whether it's through pain or whether we start taxing people to a point where they just sell. Um, I'm not as optimistic about a multifamily. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, uh, just this, this week, um, the Biden administration announces $5.8 trillion, right, which amounts to more printing of money. So now we're going right. to have more money flooding the system, chasing fewer goods. And, you know, what's that going to mean to the economy? You got to I would assume you have to pay the piper at some point or you just keep delaying the inevitable and and then that inevitable uh, seems to to worsen. And so um, I'm with Steve. It's, it's still real estate's probably the best hedge against uh, what we see. Right. It's always been a great hedge against uh, inflation. And, um, you know, I'm in the process of buying two multifamily buildings myself. And so I'm still uh, bullish in that way. But I'm also cognizant that, you know what, I better have a little extra margin in the deal because things could change. That's right. uh, Correct. Um, That's right. Correct. If you think the weather might get a little cold, <laughs> take a light jacket with you. This is, this is throughout life. You have to adjust to changing circumstances. Winston yes. Churchill said, when you're going through hell, keep going. And so we can't fold up our tents. Yes, I think, Mike, you're right. There are going to be some challenges ahead. But the challenges, when met, will turn out to be good for the tenants, good for the landlords, good for the country, good for the people, all the people involved, because there are plenty of tenants who want to pay a fair price for a place that is clean and safe and livable and pleasant and that they can call home. And the I landlords agree. who do that and do that correctly by providing habitable premises that are well-maintained and that have appropriate conduct rules so that everyone can enjoy and be a part of a community where the resident manager looks at themselves as being the mayor of a small town, when that attitude prevails, there's harmony. It's great. Nobody, not the tenants, not the landlords, want anyone making regulations to change things. So this is a matter of responsible, ethical capitalism and mutual benefit practices where people do the right thing in order to make more money. And they do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And those are inextric inextricably tied. 
business properly conducted is always ethical and always moral and always fair. And if it isn't moral or ethical or fair, it isn't a good business practice and it won't make money in the long run. Well, gentlemen, I look forward to the three of us being together, including uh, Bruce Norris, Stephen Hall, Gil Figueroa. Um, I think what people appreciate at the event is that it's not a canned presentation between uh, the five of us. Each of us have our own opinion. Each of us have our own approach to real estate uh, investing. And uh, all of us feel open to share that opinion, even though the opinion uh, may not that opinion may not be shared between the five of us. But I think Again, the attendees appreciate that because then they can take what they've heard and chew on that and make a decision for themselves in what direction they want to take their uh, portfolio. So again, Steve, Mike, I want to thank you for your time here today, uh, your information you've shared with the landlords, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Chris, I want to say thank you for organizing this and pulling it together. I think it's a tremendous service to the people who there's so much information out in the world that's available right now. So much of it is at, at is is not useful and much of it is harmful. And for you to be able to pull this together so that we can actually say things that matter and that will help people, I, I, that can't be beat. I agree. Chris, I don't know where you have the time to, to get all this stuff pulled together, but more power to you. It, it's, it's really a great asset to people. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure. All right, gentlemen, we'll be seeing you soon. All right, folks. Now, as you can tell, Steve and Mike might be on opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to their optimism in the days ahead of being a multifamily investor, but they do share one thing in common, and that is their passion to protect landlords and investors like you and I. I hope you found uh, it informative today, some information that could assist you. And if you have not already, be sure to subscribe to our channel, give the video a like, Tune in as in the days ahead, we will continue to bring you the information that will assist you as you build your financial legacy in multifamily properties. And until next time, Chris German wishing you positive cash flow, tenants who behave, and much protection from Uncle Sam. See you then.